so so it didn't uh, actually did not work at all with mbi account uh but since we have this independent account it uh, it works but yeah for, for example now it's already started uh, but, but it's not always the case all right uh, i would suggest to start uh, so the um, to, to the afternoon on, on schedule. Um, so we're very happy that Oleg Ruchaisky uh, will uh, open the afternoon with Big Bang Nucleus and this is, uh, please go ahead. Yes, well, thank you. So uh, I must say that I was, it took me some time to decide how to make half an hour talk about Big Bang Nucleus synthesis. The subject is 75 years old and there are people amongst so participants who worked on it when I was still in school. So um, I, I wasn't sure about how to, what to say. And so like I decided that I will not do a review lecture because like, again, because people sort of know it. So very briefly, yes, nuclear synthesis is one of the pillars of cosmology, meaning that this together with CMB and Hubble expansion, this is what gave birth to the Big Bang, the hot Big Bang theory. And in very short abundances of light elements, lithium, helium, deuterium are predicted and compared with observations. And I decided when preparing to this talk to look at the literature. What has happened, if anything, in nuclear synthesis in the last roughly five years, give or take? What's new in measurements? What's new in predictions? And it's not a complete overview because it turns out that a lot has happened. So let me give you incomplete, but still probably informative overview of the situation. So uh, nuclear synthesis is really a synthesis and it's a synthesis of very different branches of um, science. Of course, it's general relativity because everything takes place in the expanding universe. Of course, it's particle species physics because a lot of species appear and disappear, go out of equilibrium, manipulate, so that all of us are physics there. It's also nuclear physics and thermodynamics because the generation of or production of light elements is driven by nuclear reactions. And in very, very kind of short terms, I will not go into too many details and too many equations. What happens is the following. So, um, Protons and neutrons, which were formed when the QCD transition happened out of quarks and leptons, uh, out of quarks, sorry, quarks, uh, cannot bind into even the lightest nucleus, the deuterium, which has a very low binding energy, until the number of photons with energy comparable to the binding energy of deuterium falls below that the number of baryons, roughly. And that's what determines the deuterium bottleneck. So uh, binding energy is of order of 2 MeV. And, um, the process doesn't start until about 80 kV. And by the time it started, the protons and neutrons already froze out of equilibrium. So there is a frozen neutron abundance amount, number of neutrons compared to the number of um, baryons. And as soon as nuclear reactions are allowed to start, they go through the deuterium bottleneck, uh, more, more or less every neutron which has not decayed by that time and then up bind it into the helium four. And that's why your first and the main element and the one which has about 25% of abundance is the helium four. Uh, it's uh, historically measured not as a number density fraction, but as a mass fraction. So YP is four times a number density fraction of helium compared to all baryons. And this is also the element which is measured the best. And so that's how you do, you compare uh, prediction of helium with observations, and this more or less your nuclear synthesis. And then you also look at the other elements. Now, the standard model physics may change anything here. May change the expansion rate through extra energy density. May change result temperature by adjusting or depleting standard model particles which affect uh, the weak reactions. May release entropy thus increasing the abundance may destroy nuclei which are already created by the late decaying particles. So in this sense, nuclear synthesis is not only a 
pillar of cosmology and our tool to check uh, that we understand physics correctly, but also a powerful tool to probe for existence of certain kinds of new physics. Sufficiently long-lived because all this takes place at times between 0.1 and tens of seconds when the new, in the Hubble time. And uh, very simplistically, if you don't want to go into details, if you don't work with this, you can just say that everything works. So-called SBBN or standard model BBN has very good prediction between, very good agreement be between the predictions, which are in yellow and oh, sorry, sorry, in pink and observations, which are in yellow. And for everything apart from lithium, which I will speak about later. And you can see it from different perspectives, from number of helium abundances compared to number of 50 degrees of freedom, from comparison abundances, etc. And all the devil, so to say, is in the details here. So let me go through some details again, focusing on the latest um, situation with nuclear synthesis. So primordial helium abundance, prediction is about 25%. If you go to the PDG, it will say that there are several measurements. PDG recommended is something like this. And there are many, there are many measurements which indeed agree with each other. There are measurements by people who essentially started the whole method by all, which all these groups work, which disagree. And this is the state of the art of the helium from kind of primordial times. Statistical errors are sufficiently small and systematics is sufficiently large. And depending on whom you trust, the helium is or is not a very well measured. Statistically, it's a beautiful, very precise thing. Now, to demonstrate that this story is not over by no means, this is a situation by, uh, around 2000. Very recently, March of this year, another group, by using essentially the same method as the previous groups, has reported their own measurement. This is more or less where the PGG sits, that's the result of which was outlier to the bigger number. And here they come. They come and say, this has statistical significance. This big sample, doing everything, of course, properly. Here we are. That's continuation of the same story. So it's not over by no means. And to explain to you how the data look like, that's the same paper. This is what you do. You measure, you look at the extremely metal poor nearby galaxies. You measure the metallicities. Oxygen is a proxy for it determine the spectral line. You measure um, single ionized, double ionized, and unionized helium absorption lines. You measure, th this is the helium abundance, but in different units. You make this plot, which for you as a particle physics sounds like a complete uh, chaos. For astronomers, it's, uh, it looks like a completely legitimate plot. And then you take linear regression to zero metallicity. This is supposed to be so. If mm, abundance of helium is correlated with metallicity overall in stars, because of course helium can be produced in stars and can be consumed in stars. There are helium burning stars, there, are, there is production of helium, but nevertheless, you believe that this is the case. Of course, you can immediately see that there are, that there are galaxies which show lesser amount of helium than primordial. And this doesn't bother you because again, helium can be consumed. But this is your method, of course, with a lot of details. But you should understand that each of those works have a plot like that. It's, there is nothing kind of obnoxious about or abnormal about this plot. This is how it is. And that is, that is why you end up with a situation like that. I mean, surprising actually is that you can have such a concordance, I would say. However, let's kind of stay here for a while. And yes, so this number is related to the usual uh, helium abundance by, by this relation. That's, that's just different definition which they use in the paper. Let's stay here for a while and discuss what if, just to demonstrate for you how BBN works. Yeah, uh, actually, before I do that, you can ask, is there anything cleaner than this scatter plot? Answer is yes. You can measure helium abundance exactly from CMB because uh, there is a combination of helium, it's not at the same time as recombination of hydrogen, you are very much sensitive to free electrons, some of them, if 25% of them are gone or stay, you see it. 
Yes, you can determine this number from CMB. However, the error bar is about 10 times bigger. Here it's 0 0.03, and here it's 0, 0 0.003, and here it's 0 0.03. There are another ideas. Let's look into in, in the intergalactic gas. It's almost pristine. There is almost no structure formation there, uh, star formation there. Let's take a quasar behind this intergalactic gas. Look at the absorption lines, find the helium absorption. Again, very good measurement. Again, it's very recent. It's a nature paper of 2018. Again, you get consistent number. It's about a factor of 10 bigger error Sooner or later, these methods will get precise enough to figure out the as, as, as astronomical uncertainties. But for now, there are methods which work, which understandably work clean, don't, don't rely on complicated kind of stellar histories, but they are so far not as precise. As these methods, which on the other hand suffer from some kind of systematic uncertainties. Again, people spend a lot of Effort is this all, all, all these are big papers trying to account for this, but and they do the best they can, but nevertheless, this is the situation. Now, the same authors which uh, claim this small helium abundance immediately said, Okay, let's see what does it mean. Helium abundance is uh, neutron abundance that frees out times the time in units of uh, neutron time between. Neutron frees out and the deuterium bottleneck. To make Y smaller, either T should be larger or Xn should be decreased, for example. So, what, how to make uh, T larger? You should decrease G effective. Then, at the same temperature, your universe will be older. So some people claim that, well, actually they prefer not three neutrinos, but 2.5 neutrinos. Again, this all at the level of one to between two and three sigma. This is your standard BBN. This is your Planck measurement of uh, baryon asymmetry. Everything here is with a grain of salt. I am using this recent work to illustrate how much you can start to say about this, um, about the universe, given the helium measurement, new helium measurement. Uh, now, can you get this 2.5? I mean, clearly you can get extra degrees of freedom because this N effective is just a radiation density in excess of uh, the, that sitting in the photons. Can you get smaller than three N effective? The answer is yes, it has been known for some time. Example, let's take our beloved sterile neutrinos with MEVGV masses, lifetime of the order of uh, seconds from 0 0.1 to maybe 100. They can modify everything. Expansion rate because they give the energy density and peak conversion rate due to weak interactions and peak conversion rate due to strong interactions. I will speak about this now. But first of all, uh, if you start to inject, if you decay to leptons and neutrinos with certain branching ratios, uh, depending on at what time and what energy you inject in neutrinos, they mm, get distributed unequally between electromagnetic component and neutrino component of your plasma. And you can do it such, and you can find parameters as such, that after neutrinos have decoupled, you have distributed some extra energy to electromagnetic part and to the neutrino part. And in this way, your a relative contribution of the two can change in increase of your N effective or into the direction of decrease of your N effective. So the same HNL with roughly the same parameters of their lifetime and mass can account for extra 0.4 species or can for the decrease of 0.4 species. So if this some two years from now is seriously confirmed and we're sitting here. You can easily demonstrate that a, a model of HNL of sterile neutrino can explain this observation. Extra energy density actually leads to the suppressed number of N effects. Paradoxical, but once you think about this, it's quite um, possible. So 
there are several papers about this paper by Alexei with the students and uh, by other group. You're welcome to look for more details there. But overall, the idea is that what fraction of energy goes to electromagnetic plasma or to the neutrino sector depends very much on the energy of neutrino, different colors, or on the injection time. But Oreg, Oreg, yeah, you, you know my my work, right? And actually, the there's a problem in the community that the, such a decaying particle at around the MEB epoch, they didn't consider the summarization or in summarization of neutrino background. You know that, right? You also wrote the summarization paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, this whole, think... this is not my work, but I know it officially well. So they do consider summarization because the neutrino is much more high energy than the rest of the background. So it actually, it's not decoupled. When you inject this neutrino, it has, um, it has interaction potential. And so it interacts and that's how, and that's how it can move uh, various ways. It can distribute, uh, deposit energy into both components. That's how yeah, neutrino can deposit component into the electromagnetic uh, plasma. No, 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 right. So uh, electromagnetic plasma is, can sorry, be summarized, but yeah. Uh, can we postpone the discussion to the discussion session? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. So I, I agree with you. The process of normalization is not trivial here. And again, this is by no means complete literature, just two recent papers which discuss it. And again, I, I apologize in advance that not everything here is accounted, simply because I, it would be too much uh, work. Now, now, let me continue for one step. Uh, the idea of, again, this work said, okay, the helium abundance can be lowered because there is a non-zero chemical potential in electron neutrinos sitting in the plasma. Why? Well, chemical potential is a twofold um, story. On the one hand, if you have temperature and chemical potential, your energy density is higher than if you just had temperature. So here you get extra ineffective also. On the other hand, you are able to lower your neutron to proton ratio can be altered by changing chemical potential. And chemical potential, which they claim, is quite sizable, order few percent of the temperature. Now, uh, it has this question has been analyzed in, in a number of papers in the past, most recently, again, two years ago, where it was argued that if you include chemical potential in your primordial plasma, then your BBN bounds become actually weaker, meaning so this, this work by Kusenko and Kurtzel uh, demonstrates that um, a part of the parameter space excluded at the zero electron number becomes allowed at non-zero number. And again, it's a non-obvious statement because you need to study the combination of several effects. And they may work in different directions. I mean, th this one always increases uh, your ineffective, so it decreases you know, the time between freeze out and uh, the deuterium bottleneck. This can go both ways depending on the sign. It's an interesting question, especially for some of us who, who work on the models where large, large le late lepton asymmetry exists. But of course, this all hinges on the fact that this observation is very new and so far it's in certain disagreement with everybody else. Nevertheless, I thought it's interesting to mention the, the, this possibility. Next step, uh, again, coming back to the same equation. As I said, it, it, you can decrease or change the helium yield, not by changing the time between freeze out and deuterium bottleneck, but by changing the value of um, neutrino abundance and freeze out. And this is the recent result of ours which discussed the situation when, again, the same HNLs, now with mass larger than the mass of pion, start to decay, and start to decay with mesons of the final states. As soon as pions, lightest mesons, appear in the plasma, they completely change the story of the BBM. Essentially, pions are, do not can distinguish to the first approximation proton from neutron, it's isotope, as, a, as a spin symmetry. And as a result, they drive um, the abund abundance of proton neutron to the equal number, completely removing 
So in driving this abundance away from the SBBN value somewhere to order 0 0.5, which is much, much larger. And therefore, as long as there are as many pions as there are nucleons in plasma, your neutron abundance is completely off. What you need to do, and, and yes, when they, when they stop, you start to relax due to weak reactions, and this is a very slow process. And as a result, you end up at the deuterium button neck time with much higher neutron to proton abundance. And the only way to deal with the situation is to make sure that by the time new neutrons need to freeze out, you don't have any sizable number of piles in your plasma, which means that you should be, you should make sure that exponential tail, only exponential tail of your decaying HNLs survives. And that makes your bounds by a factor of about five stronger than previously estimated. So people used to think for 20 years, or 30 if it's right here, I'm sure, uh, that, um, that the bound for the mass above the pile mass will be about 0 0.1 second, which is few MeV temperatures out fine. Actually, no, because if at that time you still have HNLs, their parameters are such that their abundance is so they have in the equilibrium that throws out, and this creates enormous amount of pions, and then this whole story happens. And therefore, the bound here is actually much stronger, so they need to decay much earlier, and because you need to make sure that the exponential tail of the decaying population survives. And that's an, that's an example of a very recent work which changed predictions of the very well-known BBN model, which was around for several decades. So the subject is still alive. Accidentally, the same story happens if you would consider not the HNLs, but the dark scalar. So Higgs-like particle interacting with standard model particles with suppressed strengths and having decay channels, pairs of um, leptons, mesons, even baryons and baryons, etc. Depending on what you inject into the plasma, pions, kaons, or baryons, you change your SBBN neutron abundance in different ways. For mesons, you drive it up. For barons, you can even drive it, drive it down because you can annihilate barons, because antibarons appear in the plasma. And all this means that for dark scalar, as soon as your two pion production channel is open, you see it again as a, as a lifetime of about 0, 0.0 something similar to to the HNL case. And many different steps, many different regimes having to do with your possibility to annihilate the power of pions, to decay to the power of pions, to the ability to produce chaos, to ability to produce other particles. So that's that's also a story about five years old, which is very kind of interesting because you see how detailed the story is, how many things are happening with very small changes of, of uh, dark scalar mass. And that's another thing when into the story of weakly interacting uh, kind of neutrons, protons, neutrinos, strong interactions are injected and they completely dominate the story, even in small, if they're in small amounts. Simply because strong interactions are must fa much faster than weak interactions, as, as trivial as it sounds. Next subject, which has been around for a while and is quite popular, I put few papers which I could remember or just quickly found, is a very, very long-lived particles. Imagine that your particle lives so long that during the BBN time, it didn't decay in a sizable way. So you can, by increasing its lifetime, you can clearly decrease the amount of energy, entropy, particles it injects during the BBN time. What happens afterwards? Now, many things may happen, like for, Lifetimes about, that's a nice presentation for lifetimes about um, seconds to sub-seconds, you just increase the Hubble expansion rate because you sit there. Then you start to produce entropy and dilute certain relics as compared to the other dark matter, neutrino background. Then you start to photo dissociate uh, deuterium. Deuterium is a very fragile particle. Soon as you can decay and produce an MeV photon, you can destroy it. Or you can photo dissociate helium. And this actually allows you to probe 
nine orders of magnitude in particle lifetimes. So it's a, I mean, and then of course it starts to become a, an interplay between not only BBN, but also CMB. So both in terms of dark scalars and in terms of the sterile neutrinos, you can see a huge span of coupling constants and masses, where these very long particles surviving post BBN. Everything here dies before the onset of the BBN. That's what you need to do. You need to stop to, to, to kill all the particles well before the uh, neutrons froze out. Here, it's the other way around. You are living so long that you can get, start to produce some decay products very late when the nuclei are already formed. And you can affect them, you can destroy them, and in this way, you can also get your bounds. Yes, so that's more or less a short overview of uh, helium four situation. New measurements, new bounds coming from new understood phenomena. Now, second interesting element is lithium. When I told you the standard BBN worked, I actually lied because there is this lithium abundance, there is its measured value, and there is its prediction. And your prediction is way higher than the measured value, factor three to four. And this has been known for years, decades, and it's known as the cosmological lithium problem. And again, in preparation, for, I, I never worked on this myself, but in preparation for the talk, I decided to see what is the status there now. Okay, just to remind you, what the situation is a lithium? Lithium is easily destroyed in the interiors of the stars. So if the lithium gets into the star at temperature about a million Kelvin, it will get destroyed by swallowing a proton, essentially. And so people, and uh, so the, the idea was if you take old stars, which live in a sufficiently metal poor environment, their outside, uh, the exterior of the star will have some lithium. Indeed, it is observed there. And if the temperature of the star is low Sorry, enough, just to let you know, you have five more minutes. Should be fine. Okay. If, if the story is um, so, to, 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 okay, to make a long story short, there is some astrophysical reason why in this range of star mass, and this is a work of 82, lithium gets eaten. And in this range, it sits on the plateau. Lithium, which you see on every star you look at. And the guess is that, well, if you see a plateau and you expect something to stop being dependent on the stellar evolution, then it's probably primordial. And this speed plateau, it existed uh, in 82 and it exists uh, until now. And the very recent pa papers which I looked at still claim that they see it. And depending on the time, type of the star, they either see that uh, lithium is absorbed as it should, or it remains. So the situation is like that. Imagine that you produced that much lithium and then something have eaten all of it, but in a, new, in a universal way. That's kind of, that's possible, but it's a little bit of a strange idea. So people were arguing, well, maybe we are looking at the stars in the Milky Way, maybe it's some peculiarity, which is not really generic. Very recently, using Gaia data, People see that there is, people know that there was a dwarf galaxy which merged with the Milky Way over 10 billion years ago. And it brought with its old stars. So there is a region in our galaxy which contains a population of old stars, which are essentially extragalactic because they were built there, built 10 billion years ago in the neighboring galaxy, and then it brought to us. And people used the sur this survey of this region to look at the lithium abundance. And guess what it is? That's uh, purple uh, are our galaxy and red ones are from this uh, guy Enceladus. They kind of follow the same speed plateau. So it may be astrophysical, it may be something else, but they still believe that this is a universal, not Milky Way specific thing. So essentially this story remains as of today. Now, there is an extra twist to it. And people, most of the lithium is actually produced at late time from beryllium because beryllium gets, and beryllium plays a big role in lithium production. 
And there is a big bunch of reactions which happened here. And very recently, this bunch of people just ran the following exercise. It took the BBN nuclear net networks and they randomly changed rates, trying to guess what increase or decrease alteration of the rates would be required to reconcile SBBN prediction with uh, lithium observations. And you see that some of them need not to be changed, be changed at all. Some of them need to be changed by a factor of two. Some of them need to be changed by a factor of 10. And that sounds, of course, crazy, like, don't we know how the things interact? But it turns out, and that's another big development, that in the recent years, reactions of this type have been measured by many groups. That's a certain collaboration, and this is what people use for analysis, and this is what people measure. And this is a range of energies typical for BBM. So you do see an order of magnitude change in reaction. You don't see much here. That's another collaboration and yet another collaboration. So these are for different reactions involving beryllium. A factor of few here and there, or even factor of 10 in this case, can easily be gotten. Now, each of them says that their reaction by itself does not solve the lithium problem. They try to run the code, one of the BBN codes with modified reaction rate and do something. However, I'm not aware about anybody who would take all these reactions, all these measurements, and would honestly redo the computation with propagation of errors and other things. So it may well be that we just didn't measure properly the corresponding nuclear rates. And this is, again, all this happens in 18, 17, 19. So these are very recent measurements. And I must say that something similar happens with deuterium because this is the paper from, from, from late 2000, when, and I'm finishing, when um, they compare various recent deuterious management by the Luna collaboration or by other groups, and they see how predictions change. So yellow is your prediction, and depending on what you, what measurement you take, it may walk around. It doesn't have such a, such a drastic impact here as you saw there, but nevertheless. So let me conclude. The BBN was born over less than one year in 1948, starting from famous a alpha, beta, gamma paper, alpha stasis, etc. Now, 70 years later, or even 75, I ran the look through Profi, trying to see is it still popular. You see is the evolution of papers which mention BBN, one of its cousins in the title of abstract. It's almost 5,000 papers. And you see that, I mean, you could, that uh, the interest was kind of dropping here and now renew renewed. I would guess because of the feebly interacting particles, because there is BBN as a big, this is a big helper. And even over the last year, more than 300 papers have been written on the subject. So it's well, it's well a live subject with unique probe to certain range of masses and couplings. And it's by no means dead or over. People continue to work on it with better astrophysical measurements, better nuclear reaction cross-sections, better modeling, and of course, with all kinds of better physics. So thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Um, are there any questions? <clears throat> yes, Huri, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a fast question. And um, you gave this uh, new measurement uh, for helium yield, uh, which is slightly less yes. than usual. Now, uh, you said that the error, uh, which uh, I mean, authors give uh, are quite uh, small, but how, how much this really estimation of errors are uh, believable? And uh, can it be simply that uh, uh, there is an underestimation of errors, and this number is consistent with the others. Look, uh, uh, as an outsider, <coughs> in this situation, I would say yes. And when we would do some work about bounds, like here, for example, we would need an upper bound on uh, here bounds, we would take this upper bound, not the PDG recommended value, because we understand that there may be some unaccounted systematic errors. Of course, people go into the longer lengths in their papers 
estimating systematic errors and propagating them. And uh, I don't want to sound arrogant and say, oh, they just don't know how to estimate systematic errors. I mean, I think it's, an, it's a live scientific research and it's up to each of us how to interpret this as a ground truth value, or we should say that actually the error bar is from here to here, essentially, which would make it even less precise than cosmological helium, right? Or any of the cosmological measurements. I mean, just and then we are free to make our draw scientific conclusions. But I looking think at the diagram, that uh, previous diagram, which, uh, which yes, this one, which uh, shows different uh, uh, different measurements, uh, mm -hmm. practically at two sigma, all of them are consistent. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe, maybe what that's what you need to do. You just need to take the weighted average and consider this to be a a, a, co a correct helium abundance. But again, uh, it's the same story as with W boson mass measurement of CDF. Should you consider it a seven sigma anomaly away from standard model or just some unaccounted systematics? Um, it's I mean, I, I don't I don't think there is a unique prescription. There is a prescription how to deal with such situations, right? I mean, that's part of our research to decide only, and to make some conclusions. And only probably the repetition of the of the methodology and to see or more observation, I don't know. Yes, and it, it, this is what I want to st stress again. Thank you for, for, for reminding that all of this is um, the same methodology. I mean, with details, with different data, but it's not, it's, these are not drastically different methods. It's more or less the same method. Okay, thank you. Started by this group, more geotech. And there are more measurements of theirs, so actually, I mean, just not shown here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Misha, please. Uh, yeah, hi there. Uh, question. So, uh, one of your uh, uh, final slides, you showed this uh, uh, measurements of uh, cross sections. Yeah, the previous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, uh, for instance, if I take uh, the left uh, part, then there is a straight line. You said it was used in computation, and then there is measurements. So I wonder from where this uh, straight li uh, line was coming from. Is it measurement or is it some theoretical estimate? Look, uh, this is you, you cannot see it because the font is too small, but this is Wagoner 669. So uh -huh. as you probably remember, uh, when you do the BBN, at some moment you come to the moment when you need to feed all your cosmology into the chain of nuclear reaction. Mm -hmm. And then you take so-called Kavana code or one yes. of its later yeah. realizations. Mm -hmm. But Kavana code is some Fortran code written by a guy in Fermilab, not even as a refereed publication, but it's preprint, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so it's a complete black box, which goes back to 90s, if not 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people try to modify it, and there are a lot of feeds which describe how cross-sections change, and which estimate so-called astro astrophysical S factors, namely how the Coulomb barrier works at small, at small relative velocities. Mm -hmm. Because as far as I understand, the problem with the measurement here is that in the primordial plasma, your velocities are relatively small as mm -hmm. compared to your kind of accelerator-like experiment. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a way of understanding how the Coulomb barrier uh, affects you. And so there are some semi-analytical formulas. So these lines are phenomenology. Mm -hmm. People's understanding of nuclear physics, feeding of some data, and sometimes extrapolating. I mean, as you can see, sometimes they're completely straight, which sounds strange. Sometimes they are shapey. And uh, it also doesn't contain any error marks. So it's... Um, yes, it, it is definitely not a measurement. Although I think its coefficient might have been tuned to some measurement of this time, but this is again, is 69. I see. Right? So, I see. so looking at that, you would say that uh, this should be all reanalyzed, so to say. Yes. From like, scratch. Yes, and if you would look at this, it's completely different people, completely different col collaboration, completely different measurements. It's deuterium plus, uh, no, sorry, it's beryllium plus uh, neutron. That was deuterium. So they also compare with some of the Wagner's old work, uh, which is like this line, and they see something mm -hmm. like that. And it, mm -hmm. so I think, I think, and again, this paper gave me extra confidence in this, that given that this is all very nonlinear evolution, you should, and yes, each of them takes their own rate, put it into the Kavana-like code and see how much it changes situation. 
but all the other rates they keep as uh, hard coded in the code. I mean, you really need to take it and to take the whole digest of existing reactions and to repeat it, or probably do something like this people do, but with the real data, not with uh, generated uh, rates, because this one's just generated rates by some random Monte Carlo around the best, the best predicted. I see. But this uh, this type of measurement, they don't touch uh, helium three and ethereum. Uh, for the ethereum, there is their own measurements like this Luna collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, for helium three, there is also something which I I wanted to put it, but I said that it would be too much. Like yes, for helium, thank you for reminding me. For helium three, there is similar situations. There are recent within the last five years remeasurements of certain of the helium three reactions. Mm -hmm. So it will be, of course, funny if five years from now it will all go down to just properly measuring beryllium re reactions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we have time for one more question. Is if there is something? So, uh, Kazunori, maybe. So sorry for uh, cutting you short earlier. Yes, Kaz. No, no, no. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, already, already, I answered. Yeah. Actually, yeah, such a high energy neutrino emission, or yeah, in that case, the, we have to take care of neutrino, background neutrino summarization or non summarization, right? Yeah, yes. but uh, sometimes people omitted it. So I'm very worried about it in this community. No, yes. this paper, <laughs> uh, which I, from which I took a plot, this one. They spend a lot of time dealing with this uh, thermalization and various regimes, and there was a whole kind of digest in what regime leads to what. So, but yes, I agree, it's sufficiently tricky question, and um, right. we need to, to study it properly because yeah, yeah, I I think only four groups can do it, but another group didn't do that. So yeah, it's just a dilute background meeting or something. So I think it's a problem. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah, you're, you're right. But I think you agree, uh, and that was probably my main message, that by injecting particles like HNLs with ejects, leptons and neutrinos at different times and at different energies, you may drive an effective up or down. Right. Because in the old times, to think that whatever new physics is there, it will increase an effective, if anything. Hmm. But no, it can actually also decrease an effective by right, that's the point. hitting electromagnetic component more than neutrino component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. I have been engaged, engaged in that, that kind of summarization or non-summarization for more than 20 years. So, yeah, so sometimes e, n, n new is less than three. Yeah, if we take care of the summarization. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. All right, then uh, let's thank Oleg again for this very nice talk and discussion. Um, thank you. And then uh, our next speaker will be Elena Arbuzova. Um, so, Elena, yes. can you try I'm to share ready. your screen? Yes, how to do it? Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. You must be a co host. You should be able to share, yes. Uh, do you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. It's full screen. So, um, perfect. Yeah. Then um, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank organizers for giving me a possibility to present the talk at this very interesting workshop. Uh, my talk is based on our joint works with Alexander Dalgov. Uh, they are the two joint works on this topic. and. The recent work with our Indian colleagues, uh, Koshik Dutta and, and Governor Rangarajan. So, my talk is uh, dedicated to investigating on problem of stability of traditional uh, pariogenesis scenario and the prob uh, its possible resolution by uh, adding nonlinear curvature terms into usual action of general relativity. Uh, here is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I am going to consider uh, gravitational baryogenesis uh, with bosons, uh, with, uh, scalars, and with uh, relativistic fermions. 
and we will see that the interaction of this field with the curvature scalar leads uh, to strong instability of gravitational equation of motions and noticeable distortion of the standard cosmology. In the next uh, part of my talk, uh, I am going to consider a scenario, uh, uh, maybe possible resolution of the problem of instability by adding R square term into the action of uh, general relativity. And again, we consider previous cases uh, uh, interaction with bosons and fermions. Uh, the in excess of matter of over antimatter is our universe, In our universe is uh, crucial for our existence, and, and it is well established uh, by uh, observations. However, we do not understand uh, the original of such antisymmetry between matter and antimatter around us. Uh, uh, the local universe is clearly matter-dominated, so the amount of antimatter is very small, and it can be explained as a result of high energy collisions in space. Uh, the existence of large regions of antimatter in our neighborhood would produce high energy radiation as a consequence of matter-antimatter annihilation, which is not observed. Any initial symmetry at inflation could not solve the problem of the observed excess of matter over antimatter because the energy density associated with baryonic number would not allow for sufficiently long inflation. But on the other hand, matter and antimatter seem to have similar properties. Therefore, we could expect a matter-antimatter symmetric universe. So a satisfactory model of our universe should be able to explain the origin of the matter-antimatter asymmetry around us. And the term baryogenesis is used to indicate the generation of the asymmetry between baryons, mostly protons and neutrons, and antibaryons, antiprotons, and antineutrons. Uh, in nine, at 1967, uh, Andrei Sakharov voice pointed three ingredients to produce uh, meta-antimeta asymmetry from initially symmetric uh, universe. Now we know them as Sakharov, Sakharov principles, and they include non-conservation of baryonic number, breaking of symmetry between particles and antiparticles, and deviation from thermal equilibrium. However, not all of these three principles are strictly necessary. And uh, below you can see the list of various baryogenesis scenarios uh, uh, arranged in chronological order. And uh, I am going uh, to talk a little bit about spontaneous baryogenesis and concentrate on gravitational baryogenesis and baryogenesis in extended theories of gravity. And uh, uh, Spontaneous baryogenesis scenario as well as gravitational baryogenesis scenario do not demand an explicit C and CP violation and can, and can proceed in thermal equilibrium. Moreover, they are most efficiently in thermal equilibrium. Uh, the idea uh, that the cosmological baryon asymmetry can be created by spontaneous baryogenesis in thermal equilibrium was was mentioned in uh, work by Cohen and Kaplan in 1987 and in subsequent papers by Cohen, Kaplan, and Nelson. And uh, there are some reviews on this topic. Uh, you can find uh, them. And uh, the term spontaneous is related to spontaneous breaking of underlying symmetry of the theory. Uh, it is uh, supposed that in unbroken phase, the theory is invariant with respect to the global U of 1 symmetry, which ensures conservation of total baryonic number. After that, the symmetry is supposed to be spontaneously broken, and in the broken phase, the Lagrangian uh, density acquires such term. It's uh, interaction between the derivative of the theta field, uh, pseudo Galton field, and the baryonic current of matter fields. Uh, if we consider specially homogeneous field theta, which depends only on time, the Lagrangian density is reduced to such simple form 
here in B, if the baryonic number density, it's time component of the uh, baryonic current, and it is tempting to identify uh, theta dot with the chemical potential of the corresponding system. However, uh, it was shown in our paper with Dalgov et Novikov that the identification of theta dot with chemical potential is questionable. It depends upon the representation chosen for the fermionic fields, and it is heavily based on the assumption that theta dot uh, is constant. Still, the scenario is operated and presents a beautiful possibility to create an excess of particles of antiparticles in the universe. And uh, stimulated by the spontaneous gravitational baryogenesis, the idea of by spontaneous baryogenesis, the idea of gravitational baryogenesis was put forward. The scenario of spontaneous baryogenesis was modified by introduction of the coupling of the baryonic current to the derivative of the curvature scalar R. And uh, M is here a constant parameter with dimension of mass. However, the addition of the curvature dependent term to the uh, Einstein given Lagrangian of general relativity leads to higher order gravitational equations, namely Ford's order gravitational equations of motion which are strongly unstable with respect to small perturbations. Uh, first, let us consider gravitational baryogenesis with the scalar baryons. We assume that the baryonic number is carried by the scalar field phi with the potential u. And here you can see the action of the scalar model. Uh, here uh, I indicate uh, curvature dependent term which describes interaction between the derivative of the curvature scalar with the baryonic current. If the potential u of phi is not invariant with respect to u of one uh, rotation, the baryonic current uh, defined in usual way is not conserved. Here q is a baryonic number of the field phi and the corresponding equation of motion uh, which uh, follows from the presented action has the following form. Here d mu, d mu is a covariant derivative, t mu nu is the energy momentum tensor of matter, t, t mu nu is the uh, trace of the energy momentum tensor of matter. Here uh, you can see the trace equation uh, of the equation of motion following from the presented action. Equation of motion for field phi has the following form, and according to the definition presented on this slide, the current divergence has the following form. If potential is invariant uh, with respect to the phase rotation, the last blue term disappears, but the current still is non-conserved. Uh, however, this non-conservation does not lead to any cosmological baryon asymmetry. Uh, since it can produce or annihilate an equal number of baryons and antibaryons, uh, because the current non conservation is bilinear in terms of uh, phi and phi star. Uh, to create cosmological baryon asymmetry, we need to add new types of interaction, for example, uh, phi to four interaction, uh, and in this case, the potential will be not invariant with respect to phase rotation. However, uh, the baryonic current is not conserved. Uh, in what follows, we consider especially flat uh, friedman limeter robertson alter uh, background metric in the following form. And in the homogeneous case, uh, the equation for the curvature scalar uh, is reduced uh, for this form. Here we see the divergence of the current, baryonic current, and t dot is a trace of the energy momentum tensor of matter, including contribution from the phi field. In the homogeneous and isotropic cosmological plasma, uh, the trace of the energy momentum tensor of matter equal rho minus uh, 3p, where rho is the energy density of matter and uh, p is the pressure of plasma. And the relativistic plasma energy density is proportional to the force power of temperature as well as the Hubble parameter squared. 
the covariant divergence of the current with the homogeneous case presented here. This is a term with high derivative, second derivative in time, and we take into account uh, into gravitational equation of motion. And to proceed, we need to find the expectation values of the product of quantum operators phi and pi star and the derivatives, and we perform uh, thermal averaging and, and obtain the following values. And in such case, equation of motion for the classical field R in cosmological plasma takes the following form, and we see that we obtained the fourth order differential equation for uh, curvature scalar. That such red terms. Uh, keeping only linear in curvature terms and neglecting higher powers of curvature, uh, we obtain the linear fourth order differential equation and we find, uh, we look for the solution of this equation in the form presented here and find that there are two solutions with positive real parts of lambda lambda follows from the characteristic equation and we see that the curvature scalar is exponentially unstable with respect to small perturbations so curvature should rise exponentially fast with time and quickly oscillate around this rising function uh, it is interesting to check if the characteristic rate of the perturbation explosion is much larger than the rate of the universe expansion and it will be so if the following condition is fulfilled. And we find that this condition is fulfilled if the temperature is less than uh, Planck mass uh, to power three fifths by uh, parameter M to two fifths. And uh, this uh, fulfilled almost uh, during all the history of the universe. At this temperature, the instability is quickly developed and the standard cosmology would be destroyed. If you want to preserve the successful BBN results, we need to impose the condition the development of the instability was longer than the Hubble time at the BBN epoch temperature about one MeV. So we find that M should be extremely small, less than 10 minus 32 MeV. At such tiny M leads to huge strengths of the coupling. So the next uh, case which uh, I am going to consider is uh, the gravitational baryogenesis with fermions. And we start from the action in the following form. Here L is the Lagrangian density of the field's uh, quark or quark light field uh, with non-zero baryonic number. L is another fermionic field here uh, red term is again interaction of the derivative of the curvature scalar with the baryonic current uh, l -met, uh, describes all other forms of weta and uh, the baryonic current uh, is presented by the following form it's now quarks baryonic current and uh, uh, nabla is e the covariant derivative of the direct fermion in tetrad formalism. Uh, the four fermion interaction between quarks and leptons presented here is introduced to ensure the necessary non conservation of the baryonic number. And the gravitational equation of motion in this case can be written as following. Here, demo again uh, the usual tensor covariant derivative in the background metric. And we have the term which contains uh, divergence of the baryonic current. Taking trace of the previous equation of motion, we obtain uh, equation for the curvature scalar. And we have term which contains uh, current divergence. And uh, we will see that the, this term leads to the fourth order equation of motion for the curvature scalar. Uh, we find uh, current divergence uh, via kinetic equations, and we will see that it leads to uh, explicit dependence on the derivative of the curvature scalar. 
again, we can see the uh, homogeneous and isotropic uh, Friedman Robinson or Kerr background. And uh, we assume uh, that uh, we uh, consider uh, the equilibrium. Is, uh, we have an equilibrium with respect to elastic scattering and, and annihilation. And we can use the equilibrium distribution functions uh, of quartz, quartz and leptons. And here, psi is a dimensionless chemical potential uh, different for quarks and leptons. And this assumption of kinetic equilibrium is well uh, justified since it is usually enforced uh, by very efficient elastic scattering. The baryonic number density is given by the following expression, and it contains uh, dimensional uh, chemical potential. And now we can write uh, the kinetic equation. As an example, we consider the reaction of transition of two quarks into antiquark and lepton. And uh, in uh, our metric, the kinetic equation uh, for the baryonic number density n is uh, reduced for this equation, but uh, in right hand side of this equation, we have the collision integral. Uh, and in the case of small dimensionless chemical potential of quarks, quarks and leptons, uh, the collision integral can be reduced to, to such uh, quite simple form. And we have a term which originated from the uh, uh, interaction between the curvature scalar and baryonic current. Uh, we consider in what follows simple situation of quasi-stationary background. So we can approximate curvature as a product, product of the derivative of curvature by time. And we assume that uh, the uh, R dot is almost constant, it is uh, very, uh, it is a very slow change during our processes. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I, I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. Can you, can you change the slides? Uh, yeah. What can I do? I don't see my next slide. Maybe if you change to the next one, even the next one, maybe it's just yes. the one empty. I, I, it should not be so. I try to change to the next phone. Uh, what can I do? It, is it was slide but now. Uh, now, can you see my presentation now? No, no. No. If you if you go uh, from the I mean now you are full screen if you change it to not to the full screen mode. I try. Something's wrong with my computer. I'm sorry. So you see, you don't see my. No, no, now you are now, now at all. Eh? I tried to do it again to share my screen. In the worst case, I can share it from my computer. Yes, I try to share by myself. Uh, now uh, you can see it. Yes, yes. Uh, Maybe I let's leave it. Like I that. see it in uh, such <laughs> PDF file. Yeah, yeah. Maybe let's not go into the full screen. Yes, yes. So what do I was told? Was it twenty one or? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we were here on the collision integral. Just to so, say you have about seven minutes from now. Yes, yes, it's okay for me. Thank you. So we uh, uh, can write our kinetic equation in the simple form, such simple form. Here we see kinetic equation for the dimensional chemical potential. And gamma is the rate of being non conserving reactions. So if gamma is large, this equation can be solved in stationary po point approximation. And uh, here, uh, xi egg is the equilibrium solution uh, which annihilate the collision integral. So if we substitute uh, this solution into equation of motion for trace, it is presented here. 
we arrive to the fourth order equation for curvature. So we have here two derivatives, third derivative dt, and uh, the fourth derivative is here uh, r dot. So again, we arrive to the fourth order equation uh, for the curvature. Uh, and uh, again, we have uh, uh, extremely unstable solutions of this equation with instability time uh, by far shorter than the cosmological time. Uh, now it is interesting to find a possible mechanism to stabilize the situation. And um, it seems to me that such mechanism uh, to us, it seems to us that such mechanism can be found in R squared modification of gravity. So we add uh, the term proportional to the curvature squared into the usual action of general relativity, which is presented here. And uh, it is known that R squared term in the, uni in the early universe generates inflation and density perturbations. It leads to excitation of the scalar degrees of freedom, the scalar degree of freedom uh, named scaleron with the mass MR here. And uh, the amplitude of the observed density perturbations demand uh, that uh, MR is equal to 3.5. Uh, 10 to 13 GeV. And now we can consider the uh, total action with adding of such uh, nonlinear and curvature term. In the Bosonian case, so I repeat uh, a consideration with uh, R squared term added into the action. Here I present action for the uh, complex scalar field phi, and we have interaction again in red. Uh, of the derivative of curvature with a baryonic current of phi field and the R squared term added into the gravitational action. Um, we can rewrite it, or we can obtain equation for the curvature evolution in the following form. And again, we have such green term which will stabilize, stabilize our solution. Uh, we rewrite our equation in the Freeman limiter Robinson Wolfe metric. Again, and uh, we can see the current diversions and uh, repeat the procedure presented discussed above. We obtain the fourth order differential equation, but now we have not only term with fourth derivative of curvature, but we have also the term which is uh, which has second derivative of curvature. So we again. Uh, look for the solution in the simple exponent form, and we arrive to the characteristic equation for the solution, and we find uh, the characteristic uh, eigenvalues, lambda squared, and we see that there will be no instability when lambda square is uh, negative. Uh, it, it is so when the expression under the square root Will be, net, will be positive. So we can find stability condition in the following form, and we can estimate uh, the value of the parameter M uh, to satisfy this condition. And uh, one comment, uh, the value of lambda depends upon the relation between of kappa and uh, scaleron mass. If kappa is of order of the scaleron mass, the frequency of oscillation is of order of the scaleron mass but if kappa is uh, much larger than the scaleron mass, there are two possible solutions with the frequency of order of the scaleron mass and with the frequency much larger than the scaleron mass. But uh, high frequency oscillation of curvature would lead to efficient gravitational particle production and as a result to damping of the oscillations. And uh, the last case, uh, the last slide before conclusion, it's uh, uh, stabilization in fermionic case. Again, we introduced R squared term into the action with fermionic current, with the, with the fermionic fields, and we repeated uh, the same calculation as the previous cases. And we see uh, incomplete analogy with previous, yes, with previous cases. We obtain uh, the equation for the curvature scalar and we have the 
storm which stabilizes stabilize, stabilize our solution and uh, it is very similar uh, for the bosonic case. And now conclusion. Uh, the derivative coupling of baryonic current to the curvature scalar in gravitational baryogenesis scenarios leads to higher for soda equation for gravitational field. These equations are unstable with respect to small perturbations of the Friedman Robinson Walker background, and such stability leads to an exponential rise of the curvature. For a large range of cosmological temperatures, the development of the instability is much faster than the universe expansion rate. Simple versions of gravitational baryogenesis based on the coupling of the uh, derivative of curvature scalar with baryonic current would be incompatible with the observations and stabilization mechanism is desirable. And the problem of stability can be solved by adding uh, to the Einstein-Hilbert action the quadratic in curvature term and stabilization still is achieved at a very high value of the curvature scalar. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, so, and for, for finishing even two minutes early. Um, so we have time for questions. Um, is the, um, yeah, go ahead, please go ahead. Okay, so thank you for the nice talk. I have one question. So the, is that, is the instability, is ghost instability, I get, I thought because uh, it's uh, the derivative of curvature, so I wonder if it is uh, to, to, to the higher derivative interaction. So I wonder if this is ghost instability. In such a case, I'm afraid if we consider quantum, quantum effect in this theory, even you, we add the curvature scale time, it would not help in a quantum mechanical theory. Do you have any? But uh, we can see the curvature is a classical field and we take uh, a thermal average of quantum field phi. So I think there is no cost. But, uh, I mean, but, but the, if this is a, this is ghost instability, so the part, I, I wonder if the theory is already catastrophic because ghost instability. And if we consider the quantum field theory, well, of the, the of the metric perturbation, then I wonder if it is. So there, just just instability suppression might not be, might not solve all the problem. Uh, I don't think that there is cost stability here in this model. And so then my, my question is that if the, the instability is ghost instability or not? So the- No, 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 no. it is not ghost instability, no. I see. Thank you very much. So let me maybe follow up on Kohei's question. So, so what, what is the instability then? So if I think in terms of a particle spectrum, then what, what um, yeah, but what is the instability? Sorry? Um, so if I, like, if I look at this theory with, with, with the yeah. higher derivative, yes. and then I, I study the particle spectrum, so, so like before adding the high derivative, it was two, just the two massless modes of the graviton. And now what, what is the spectrum uh, with, uh, with these, these uh, fourth derivative? Uh, you mean particles of phi, uh, phi field or? Uh, local particle field of the or... gravitational, or like the, the whole spectrum. So like phi field and gravitational uh, spectrum. Uh, we 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 did not consider the spectrum of the particle. We consider the evolution of the curvature scalar, and our aim was to consider evolution of the curvature scalar because uh, the model of gravitational baryogenesis is uh, used uh, to create uh, uh, meta and meta symmetry to create baryon asymmetry, and people calculated baryon asymmetry via this model. And it was created, but uh, nobody considered the stability of the, such problem. The stability which uh, connects with the evolution of the curvature scalar. So this is a problem. So you may uh, create baryon asymmetry, but uh, the system is strongly unstable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe to, to, to follow up, so, so kind of you, for, for you, the, the gravitational sector is fundamentally classical, so that you, yes. you don't think of it in terms of a particle spectrum, but... No, 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 maybe we should. Um, all right, are there any more questions? Then uh, let me maybe add one more. So, innovation for amions. So, so what was the um, the advantage? Sorry, I, I did not hear it. Um, so, what, what was the motivation for adding the, the fermions? Um, uh, adding fermions uh, instead of bosons? Yeah, so what, what was? It was interesting because uh, we can consider such reactions with quark, with quark transition or quark-like fields. It, it, it seems to us that maybe it's more realis realistic cases than the bosons, so why not? <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um. Okay, so I see no more hands. Um, so let's thank Elena again for, for the nice talk and, and, uh, and the thank questions. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so if you can stop sharing. How? <laughs> uh, what should I do to stop share? It's in like uh, top middle. If you go with your mouse, then you should find this red stuff. Ah, I, I see, I see it. <laughs> yes, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, uh, Guillermo, so maybe you can already start sharing and then yeah. uh, you see if it works. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? <clears throat> no. So far, it's a black screen. No. No, it's perfect. Um, all right. All right. So our <laughs> next speaker will be uh, Guillermo Ballesteros. And so we will be switching gears now back to the primordial black holes we already had in the morning. Um, so Guillermo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, Sebastian, please tell me when I'm close to 30 minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you after 25. All right, that's, that's fine. Okay, so the organizers asked me to, to talk specifically about primordial black holes uh, from inflation. And I added the dark matter part because I think it's the, the main motivation for this topic. So I will try to give um, an overview of um, things that can be done in, in this field, specifically focusing on single field inflation. And I should find a way to, to, to change the slides, which I can't. Sorry. Ah, like this, maybe. Yeah. All right. So I wanted to highlight the people I've been working on um, this topic, and in particular, uh, my student, uh, Alejandro Perez, who just started his PhD, and Julian Rey, who is instead uh, finishing and will be doing a a postdoc at DC from, from this uh, autumn. So <clears throat> all this story about primordial black holes and dark matter started, of, of course, uh, when LIGO detected the, for the first time the, the merger of, of black holes uh, through the gravitational wave emission. And those black holes are roughly in, in this uh, range of masses on the top of the picture. And those are black holes that have a size uh, roughly of, a, of an asteroid. And now we know for several reasons and bounds that were discussed by, by Corey in his talk that these black holes cannot constitute the dark matter, or at least uh, not all of it, just a small fraction. 
But instead, if, if instead of looking uh, at black holes that have the, the size of an asteroid, we look at black holes that have the mass of an asteroid, uh, which have uh, roughly the size of uh, an atom, if you want, um, we know uh, in this, this is a recent development of the last uh, five years or so, that uh, bounds that were previously thought to exist in, in this range are not really, um, are not really robust and they can actually be uh, all the dark matter. And this is uh, very interesting uh, also because uh, if, if the dark matter is composed of black holes of this kind, and if they come from, from inflation, there is a different uh, way of probing them with, uh, with gravitational waves, which is through a stochastic background of gravitational waves that is uh, related to the formation process, as also uh, Corey mentioned briefly in his talk. Okay, so... Uh, just to, to be sure that everybody is on the same page, uh, the window I'm talking about for, for primordial black hole dark matter is uh, between 10 to the minus 16 and 10 to the minus 12 solar masses, roughly. And this picture is, is taken by, uh, sorry, it's taken from a very nice uh, review by Anne Green and Bradley Kavanagh, where they, they, they discuss uh, many different constraints that are grouped here in in different, uh, different kinds of physics that lead to them. And they also put uh, a, a nice code uh, that allows to make these plots very easily with your preferred choice of, of bounds okay, that you can go and check on that website. All right, so now let me move on to the main topic of the talk, which is uh, the formation of these objects from, from inflation. So the idea is that if you have a, a fluctuation on a specific uh, wavelength, um, that is produced uh, during inflation or also by some other primordial mean uh, at a specific scale, as I said, and also that it's uh, large enough uh, to, to overcome a, a certain threshold for collapse. Uh, during the radiation domination, uh, regions of, of the universe which will uh, feature that sort of fluctuation will, will collapse instead of expand and eventually they will collapse into a a black hole, okay? This is the main idea. And here we can uh, visualize it just uh, plotting schematically the, the history of the universe, if you want. So this, these fluctuations will be generated uh, sometime during inflation, then they will be transferred into the radiation fluid. And when they re-enter the, the horizon during radiation itself, the, the collapse of, of those regions of the universe uh, gets started and, and they form black holes, right? So another way to, to think of this is to, to plot the probability distribution function of the, of the density fluctuations and, and to, to realize, and this is very important, that this, these fluctuations need to be very large in order to, to, to trigger this collapse and very large in comparison to the typical size of the fluctuations that, uh, that we see, for example, uh, from the temperature and isotropies of the CMB. So, the, or, the, the range uh, that, that, that is uh, needed uh, for the collapse is uh, fluctuations that are order one, essentially, or larger. And this uh, makes uh, things a little bit uh, complicated from the computational point of view, as we will discuss, okay? So this is the reason why the, the formation of primordial black holes is said to be uh, a rare event, if, if it ever happened, okay? Because these fluctuations are, are not uh, as common as the ones we normally see on the sky. So the, the mass of these objects is given uh, essentially by the, by the mass enclosed in a, in a Hubble patch at the time at which the collapse starts, okay? which is this first equation here. And this can be easily um, translated into a, a relation to uh, the number of e-folds of inflation. So you can link a, a value of the mass of the black holes to the, to the time uh, during the during inflation at which these fluctuations are produced. So for example, for, for black holes that are uh, heavy or as heavy as, the, as our sun, uh, these fluctuations need to be produced uh, around 18 or 20 e-folds after the CMB scales. And if you want black holes of the masses that are uh, relevant for dark matter, which as we said is between 10 to the minus 16 and 10 to the minus 12 solar masses, uh, this number of e-folds is around 30 or so, okay? So the abundance of the black holes is uh, given as, uh, 
as Cass uh, was telling us, uh, usually um, estimated using uh, this, this quantity beta, which represents the, the fraction of the universe that collapses into uh, black holes during radiation domination. And assuming that these uh, fluctuations that collapse have a Gaussian distribution, this can be done using this uh, analogous uh, formalism to the press sector formalism, um, where uh, it is uh, very important to, to notice first that there is this uh, threshold for collapse, delta C. So as, as we said, we have to be above this threshold. And then uh, just putting numbers in these equations, you, you realize that uh, <clears throat> the size of the power spectrum, the primordial power spectrum that you need if you want to have all the dark matter in black holes is uh, of order 10 to the minus two or so, according to this uh, kind of calculation, okay? Now, there are many questions that can be raised about the, the validity of that estimate. So is it really reliable to, to assume that these fluctuations are Gaussian? So first of all, the, the relation between the, the density and the curvature fluctuations is, is very nonlinear. So this induces uh, non-Gaussianities in the, in the density fluctuations. And also the models that typically produce uh, large power spectra uh, are, uh, are plugged by, by non-Gaussianities intrinsic uh, from, the, from the inflationary dynamics. However, it is, it is uh, also true that uh, the effect of these non-Gaussianities, and this has been discussed in a couple of papers, for example, uh, by these two people, can be compensated by uh, a change in the in the power spectrum itself. So the conclusion that you need a large power spectrum is uh, nonetheless very robust. But more in general, one can ask uh, whether this uh, this approximation of uh, of Gaussian fluctuations makes sense because that's, that's typically what we do when we when we uh, talk about fluctuations around their mean, which is uh, zero. But if we go to the tail of the distribution, this might not be true anymore, right? And in fact, there are, there are several indications and works in the literature that point that, that in reality, uh, when the fluctuations, the primordial fluctuations become very large, uh, this Gaussian approximation is probably not uh, correct. So I will highlight just a couple of them. So one of them is a recent paper by, by these people from Trieste, where they consider, for example, an, an interaction uh, uh, of these fluctuations that appears in, in some models of inflation. And they saw using some semi-classical methods that the, the tail of the distribution, instead of being Gaussian, has a different uh, fallout for, for large R. And this, this will have a, a strong impact on the abundance of the primordial black holes, just from the formulas that we just saw. And people have also tried to, to approach this problem uh, in the, in the context of, uh, of a formalism that was introduced by Starobinsky many years ago in the 80s that is called stochastic inflation that tries to address the way in which uh, fluctuations become uh, classical uh, during inflation, all right? And this, this is important because the, the, the formalism, what, uh, what assesses is the relevance. Uh, so in inflation, what we do when we have a scalar field is typically we compute the classical role of some field down some potential. But this, this is just an approximation because in reality there are also quantum fluctuations and it might be that these quantum fluctuations are important. And so first of all, they, they can be particularly important when the, when, the, when the primordial fluctuations that are produced and the metric fluctuations are large. And second, because in, in the scenario that has become more popular uh, recently for, uh, uh, for the production of primordial black holes from inflation, uh, there, is a, there is a competition, if, if you wish, between the classical role and the size of these quantum fluctuations. And this inequality that I'm showing on here gives you uh, the condition that guarantees that the classical role uh, dominates. This is very uh, hand wavy, but it still serves to make the point. And what we see is that if the primordial spectrum is small, then the classical role dominates. But when we get to, to fluctuations that are large, and so the power spectrum is also large, then uh, this is not so, so clear. And there are several papers in the literature that indicate that indeed for large uh, values of the fluctuations, the details of the distributions, in particular when in this kind of scenario that I'm, that I'm going to, to discuss next, is not, uh, is not decaying as a Gaussian, but as an exponential, which is uh, very different. 
All right, so <clears throat> now let me move on to discuss uh, concrete models after this introduction. Uh, so what do we want for a, for a model that, uh, that aims to produce uh, all the dark matter of the universe from, from, from inflation in the form of primordial black holes? So first of all, we need the model to, to satisfy the requirements that, that we want inflation uh, in this basic setting to, to do, which is to produce enough expansion of the universe to solve the horizon and flatness problems. Also to agree with the CMB and, and large scale structure data, of course and to, to reheat the universe after inflation. And in addition to this, which is already uh, quite constraining, as you know, from Planck and, and, other, uh, and, other, uh, and other probes, we want uh, all, the, all the dark matter abundance to, to be in, in the form of primordial black holes, which, as we just saw, implies a, a large primordial spectrum. And we want this in a specific uh, range of masses, which is even more constraining. So it's, as you can imagine, this is not uh, easy to all, all of these conditions are not easy to achieve uh, simultaneously. So the first paper that, uh, that I know of uh, that uh, put together these ideas of dark matter, primordial black holes, and, and inflation, the three of them together, was, uh, was written by, by these three people, uh, Ivanov, Naselsky, and Novikov, in 1994. And the idea that they had was, uh, was uh, motivated by a very simple and uh, somewhat naive observation, as we will see, which is that if uh, the inflaton somehow encounters the, during its evolution a region of the potential which is uh, very flat, uh, the power spectrum will uh, will grow because the 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 inflaton will slow down. This is uh, just based on the standard approximation to compute the primordial power spectrum from. Um, slow roll inflation okay which is uh, at the bottom of the of the slide and this model was based on on previous work by Alexei Starominsky uh, which uh, already discussed some of the features of the spectrum that uh, that we now see in many of the models that uh, that are in the in the market for primordial black color matter and on the on the left, uh, there is a picture of the extracted from the paper itself of these people, and on the right, there is a more modern uh, realization of the same idea. Okay, so how can this be done? For example, well, first of all, um, since we want to feed the CMB, as we said, uh, we need the potential to be sufficiently flat on 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 the scales that will produce the CMB fluctuations. Which is not something that was in this in this paper of 1994, and this can be done, for example, if you have a, a lambda phi to the fourth potential coupled to gravity in a simple way. This is, for example, what is done in, in Higgs inflation. Okay, and then there there, is, there needs to be some sort of uh, dynamics that produces a, an even flatter region, if you wish, uh, closer to the end of inflation, and the distance between these two regions needs needs to be uh, determined. In, in such a way that the black holes appear at the correct mass. Okay, so even though it is not uh, evident from the picture, in reality, this this flat region that will give rise to the ten to the minus two spectrum uh, has really a small minimum and, and a corresponding maximum. So there is just a little bump there. Okay, that you cannot see unless you zoom on it. And there are a couple of ways, for example, to to do this that uh, work. Uh, very well. So one of them is just to assume a polynomial potential. This has enough freedom to 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 produce this uh, this region where the black holes will will originate from from the slowdown of the inflaton. And another way to do it is to to consider the the running of the quartic coupling of the inflaton with with scale. And this can be done in, in many different contexts. But people have tried to do it, for example, in the the standard model because uh, this kind of running has been explored for, for many for many different reasons but in particular for the for the stability of the of the universe during inflation due to the to the effect of the top quark mass on the on the quartic coupling of the Higgs and in particular in that concrete example it, uh, I well, several people have been trying to, to make this work for primordial black hole dark matter, and so far there's no convincing uh, result that this, that this is possible. But if instead you, you enlarge the standard model with other particles, then it's, uh, it's a possibility to do it, okay? 
So here in this plot, what I'm representing is in, in blue, it's a, it's a plot of a potential. This is the case of the polynomial inflation. And in red, there is the, the evolution of the derivative of the, of the field uh, during inflation as a, as a value of the field itself. And the different dots, what represent is, uh, so they are, they are separate. So the distance between every two dots is the same number of efforts, which is, I think, uh, five. Sorry, uh, yes, five. So what you see is that the inflaton uh, first uh, starts rolling uh, relatively uh, fast, and then it slows down when it reaches a particular value of, of the field. And this makes the, the velocity become very, very small, close to zero. And this is what enhances the, the primordial power spectrum and therefore the, the triggers the formation of primordial black holes. So in terms of slow roll parameters, this happens because one of the typical slow roll parameters that we use, which is called eta, becomes uh, larger than, than three, uh, like breaking actually the slow roll approximation. And this breakdown of a slow roll approximation uh, makes the calculation of the, of the power spectrum a little bit more involved than, than we usually do. And in fact, it, it introduces a large uh, difference with respect to the slow roll result, as you can see in the picture on the, on the left. So the, the height of the peak uh, changes by a few orders of magnitude, and also its position changes a bit. So, so this, this modifies both the abundance and the, and the, and the mass of the black holes that, that one would compute uh, wrongly if, if the slow roll approximation was, was used. And on the right, you have a, a plot of the of the abundance uh, that you get in, in this specific case, which uh, falls in the case, in the region that is allowed for for that. Okay, and now typically all these models, uh, not not just uh, these ones that are based on a lambda phi to the four potential for large field values, but in general all the ones that uh, generate uh, primordial black holes from this kind of uh, inflection point. Uh, tend to predict or, or tend to have a somewhat slow, somewhat small uh, spectral index, uh, but this can be can be solved uh, with small complications like adding, for example, uh, some extra relativistic species in, in the form of uh, NF, or by adding a, another operator to this to this series. These are two examples. Okay, so as you can can imagine from all that I have discussed and by looking at these potentials, that there is. Uh, and, and the fact that the, the abundance depends exponentially on the size of the fluctuations, uh, this implies some, some tuning on the, on the potentials that have to be built for this purpose. And people have tried different ways of addressing this, this problem, if you think it's a problem. So one, one thing that we tried to do was to, was to combine the, uh, the idea of having a potential with multiple minima together with uh, the formation of black holes during matter domination. So, so the many minima uh, may help because they, they produce a succession of peaks in the power spectrum. And you might expect that eventually the highest of these peaks uh, is, the, is the one that will give rise to the, to the, to the black holes with the correct mass. And the, and the formation uh, during dark matter, as uh, Corey was, was telling us before, uh, is advantageous because uh, the, the scaling of the abundance is not exponential anymore, but it's of a power law kind, essentially uh, five divided by two or so, some, some order one number, which makes the power spectrum that is required uh, much smaller than, than 10 to the minus two. In particular, uh, depending on, on what is the, the temperature of the, of, the, of the universe during this uh, early phase of matter domination, you can have uh, you can have uh, values of the spectrum as low as 10 to the minus 3.5 or, or 4, which are not as extreme as this 10 to the minus 2 that we require during radiation domination. Okay, so a very interesting uh, connection between primordial black hole dark matter and gravitational waves exist. And this is because, as also uh, Corey mentioned in his talk, in this scenario, it is uh, unavoidable that you generate a stochastic background. This is just because the, these large fluctuations of, um, of curvature uh, at second order in perturbation theory uh, can uh, feed uh, tensor modes, right? This is just uh, Einstein equations. And there is a very easy relation between the mass of the black holes and the frequency of these gravitational waves. And it just happens that uh, if the mass is in the right ballpark for 
for dark matter, the frequency is around uh, one Earth or 0.1 Earth or so, which is precisely where uh, Lisa will be observing and having its best sensitivity. So um, if Lisa detects uh, uh, a stochastic background of the kind that is shown in the plot, this might be a signal of primordial black hole dark matter. And it happened in 2020 that a couple of experiments, uh, not of the kind of uh, observatory, uh, I mean, it's not an interferometer observatory, but of pulsar timing arrays, detected a signal uh, that, that could be interpreted as a, as a stochastic background of, of gravitational waves. Those, those signals would not correspond to black holes of, of this mass that I'm talking about, but it is uh, nonetheless very interesting because uh, they could, they could uh, indicate existence of many things, but in particular of a subdominant population of, of black holes of a specific mass uh, that, will, that will give rise uh, to a signal around 10 to the minus eight Earth. So this is something to, to watch out because first it was only one experiment that, that saw this signal and then other PTA experiments uh, seem to see the same as well. However, this signal does, does not have the, the quadrupolar pattern that it should have to be a stochastic background of gravitational waves, so it could be something else, and perhaps one should not get too excited uh, yet. And, and these gravitational waves are, are also interesting even for, for LIGO, if the, if the black holes uh, are not uh, relevant for, for dark matter, but, uh, but they have uh, lower, mat lower masses that, that would have already evaporated by, by today. So for example, here you see an example of black holes that are, are compatible with uh, DBN and cosmology, but are too light to be the dark matter, but still they could produce, a, they could be associated to a, to a stochastic background gravitational waves that in principle could be detected by, by LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA uh, if they accumulate sufficient, uh, sufficient data. All right, so, so far I have discussed only uh, the possibility of uh, thinking of a specific uh, models of inflation, but one could uh, go one step further and, and do an EFT approach to this problem. And this would be just uh, writing an action for the curvature fluctuations themselves instead of, uh, instead of uh, a Lagrangian for an inflator. So this is, uh, in fact, a very constrained problem because there are some some symmetries that you have to respect. And, and what you see at the, in the first line is the most general action that you can write at quadratic order for the curvature fluctuation, where all the coefficients that appear are uh, functions of time. And in the start of the inflation, for example, the mass that, uh, that, this, uh, that this action contains, this R squared term uh, is zero. So if we focus on that specific case, uh, and we do a, a simple uh, change of variables, we can write the evolution equation for, for this variable R as it is written inside the box on the bottom right. And this has a simple uh, solution in terms of this variable theta. And this solution is what is written uh, here. So it, it contains a constant part plus something, some integral that depends on these functions of time. So usually in a slow roll, this- uh, Sorry, you have yes. five minutes. Okay, usually this, this um, this uh, integral uh, decays on time, and what we get is the usual slow roll uh, power spectrum, which is on the left, which uh, is inversely proportional to the epsilon parameter, the sound speed, and the Planck mass, if you want, of these fluctuations. But what happens in these, uh, in these models that I was telling you before is that in reality, this second mode uh, containing the integral gets excited, and this is why the, the slow roll approximation does not work very well. But as you can see also from, from this slide, there are many other possibilities uh, aside from this uh, inflection point models, because you can also play with the sound speed of the fluctuations or the time evolution of the Planck mass or the mass of the fluctuations themselves, etc. Now, if in the context of uh, these CFTs, this is a field theory, you can, you can uh, ask uh, when, uh, when this uh, FETIFI theory breaks down, and this has been studied a uh, long time ago. And in particular, if you look at the uh, partial wave unitarity, you see that uh, um, the condition for the, for the validity of the EFT is that the sound speed of the fluctuation has to be uh, sufficiently larger in comparison to the power spectrum itself. So this puts a, a, a limit on, on how much uh, you can produce uh, these, these primordial black holes from, for example, uh, a variation of the sound speed, okay? 
And there are ways to, to evade this. Uh, one is to consider, for example, a modified, um, a modified dispersion relation. And this is uh, something that, that I did uh, with Sebastián Céspedes and, and Lucas Santoni showing that uh, if you assume a specific uh, kind of symmetry that appears in, in, in some models of uh, dark energy and inflation, you can indeed get uh, a large abundance of primordial black holes uh, being consistent with the, with the effective field theory. Okay? So let me now, just uh, before I conclude, tell you about another idea that we are working on at the moment. And, and this is the, the idea that the inflaton might be coupled to, significantly coupled to some other species during inflation, in such a way that uh, you would produce uh, particles of, of, of other uh, fields uh, during inflation. And this would slow down the, the evolution of the inflaton uh, due to this uh, dissipation factor gamma if gamma is sufficiently large as compared to the Hubble expansion itself. So the naive idea is that this slowdown will, will do uh, something analogous to what the inflection prior point uh, was doing in the previous example. In reality, it is not so, so trivial, but uh, fortunately, uh, uh, it turns out that the, the stochastic fluctuations produced by, the, by, the, by a thermal bath that is, uh, that is present in, in this kind of a scenario, which is uh, what, what you see in the second equation on the, on the right hand side, uh, can produce a very large peak on the, on the primordial uh, power spectrum as shown in, in the plot on the left now. And you can also compute the, the associated the gravitational wave uh, background, uh, which again can be seen by, by Lisa if the black holes are on the, on the, correct, uh, on the correct ballpark for for dark matter. And there are also a couple of papers already about this. One is by uh, Richa Aria and uh, Mar Bastero. And they both work in the, in the, in the framework of uh, something called warm inflation. But what we are doing here is a bit more general. Okay. All right. So with this, uh, if I can, I just uh, summarize quickly. So <clears throat> summary is very short. Um, I, although I couldn't discuss it because of uh, lack of time, uh, it's important to stress that when LIGO detected the uh, um, gravitational waves uh, from the merger of black holes for the first time, the bounds on, on primordial black holes as dark matter were very different from the ones that, uh, that we consider correct today. And this has been evolved uh, very rapidly during the last five years. And the consensus today does, is that uh, this specific window is uh, entirely open for, for dark matter, but uh, this might uh, change in, in the future. And in fact, uh, I think that uh, one of the most important tasks to do is to think of ways of trying to, to constrain this, uh, this wind. Okay, this is uh, regardless of the origin of the black holes. And, and then uh, specifically concerning uh, inflation and early universe, but uh, particularly inflation, there is a very rich phenomenology of theoretical uh, and, uh, and not so theoretical, but also practical questions that it's interesting to, to address in this, in this context, and, and this uh, range from the validity of perturbation theory to modified uh, histories of the early universe. And in this sense, uh, these black holes can be interesting not only as a way of uh, thinking of uh, the dark matter, but, but also as a possible uh, tool to test uh, the physics of the early universe. And finally, uh, one, of, one of the most important connections, there are others, but perhaps the most important one, is related to, to gravitational waves experiments, some of which uh, will be uh, giving data in, in a few years, right? So that's all, thank you. Mm. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? Uh, yes, Alessandro? Uh, yes, please. Um, I have a question and comment. The question refers to your uh, slide at the very beginning about the limits on uh, the um, dark matter fraction of black holes as a functional mass. This one? The one. This um, graph is obtained under the assumption of delta function or extended mass spectrum. Yeah, this, this one assumes that the, that the black holes have a single mass. That's the assumption. So you should yeah. read this. Uh, throwing lines, uh, vertical lines, if you want. Yeah, yeah I understand. What does it mean, delta function? Thank you. And there was another... But uh, let, me, let me add something. So typically, if you assume that the, 
that the black holes have some extended uh, distribution. Mm, all the examples I know, the, the, the bounds get tighter, okay? Oh, there was a review by uh, Carr and Puchnell almost a year ago who yeah. considered the extended spectrum, and their statement is that the results are less re restrictive. Uh, well, I, I, I will have to see uh, what they say to comment. Uh, it is on in the internet, so uh, first authors, Bernard Carr and... Yes, yes, yes. No, I, I remember the review, uh, probably, probably... First review was for point-like spectrum, and second, um, later one, was for, for extended. Okay. Okay, and my comment... As for the paper by Ivanov, Nasilsky, and Novikov about yes. reproduction of black hole and dark matter, our paper with Joe Silk was almost two years before. And yes. They did, and they, uh, Ivanov, Nasilsky, and Novikov, make reference to our paper. They, they did or they didn't? Sorry. They did. They did. Okay. And, and what is. And you didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't, but I because I don't know your paper and yes. I don't know what you did. Uh, sorry. I published a physical review with Joe Silk, and I will talk about that in my talk. And uh, Novikov, uh, <laughs> Ivanov, Vasilsky, Novikov even made reference to that. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry I didn't cite it. As I said, this is the first paper that I know. Uh, yeah. There may be there may be others. I I wanted to point this out because uh, Corey was saying that. Uh, uh, before uh, this inflection point story, there were other uh, works, and, and this is the earliest that I that I knew. But uh, that, that's that's. But I'm I'm happy to 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 look at your work, of course. Sorry, sorry about that. It is a rather unusual mechanism in many respects, but at least it was first paper which involved templation. And but, after okay, thank you. No, thanks to you. Uh, all right, now Alessandro. So two quick questions. Uh, first, uh, if uh, this Elisa will see nothing, uh, yes. will this field uh, be dead? Uh, no. You say no. It's unavoidable to have gravitational. No, waves. it's unavoidable in the context in which you produce the primordial black holes from uh, large fluctuations uh, originating in inflation. Okay. So, so will this be completely tested? Um, and no, because also Lisa has some sensitivity, right? So, I mean, it could be that the signal is below the sensitivity of Lisa. And this would mean that the, the black holes in the mass that I was uh, focusing on are not uh, the totality of the dark matter, but they could be part of it. No, no, I wanted all dark matter. So if, if you want, the... okay, so if you want all dark matter, so I mean, maybe the plot to look at is uh, this one. Uh, sorry. Uh, where are we? No. So if you want all the dark matter in in, in black holes, and and uh, that's that's what you want, then uh, if if Lisa sees uh, nothing, uh, it's difficult to conclude uh, that this could be the, the dark matter if they originate, as I said, from inflation and they form uh, during radiation domination. Okay. Because I, I didn't discuss the, the stochastic background of gravitational waves if, if the black holes form during matter, but uh, this could change the things slightly. Okay. So, yeah, what, what you would be excluding would be the, the dark matter of primordial black holes form um, from uh, large inflationary fluctuations and collapsing during radiation domination. That's okay. what you would exclude. So, another quick question. Huh? To get the, the, the matter in the window you like, uh, how many efforts uh, of inflation uh, needs? So, sorry, at which point uh, needs to be the, the, the inflection uh, in the potential? So, this is about uh, 30 folds, 32 efforts or so, so from the CMB scale. So, let's see if we look at this plot, this star here uh, is the CMB scale. Okay. And the distance uh, from here to I don't know if you see my my yes, my okay my mouse and the distance from here to here is about thirty efforts. Uh, so here, so how many efforts before the end? Well, uh, that depends on how long inflation lasts, right? But uh, I mean, if you if you take the minimum value that will be compatible with uh, cosmology that we know, it will be fifty, so around twenty efforts or so. 
Mm. Okay, thank you. But let me let me add something if I can, Alessandro, quickly. So it turns out that in these models uh, of inflection point, if you impose uh, three conditions simultaneously, so one that the power spectrum is large enough, okay, which you need if you want all the dark matter in pre-model black holes. Two to fit the CMB, so correct spectral index and correct tensor to scalar ratio, okay. Uh, and uh, the third condition uh, is, uh, well, uh, not uh, overcomplicating the model too much, then it turns out that uh, this forces you to have the, the peak precisely, I don't know why, but it happens, precisely where you want it for the dark matter. Okay? This is uh, probably because you don't have so much leverage in this kind of potentials to play. But it could have been somewhere else, but it is there. Okay? So it's a nice uh, coincidence if you want. Okay, thank you. All right, then, uh, Kazunori. Yes, thank you very much, Guillermo. Yeah, completely, I agree, I agree with your presentation, mm -hmm. your past was. And I have two com short comments and uh, about the BBN bound on PBN. Oh, yes. It's uh, my bound, but uh, yes. quite recently we improved because of the precise measurement of the duty. Limit. So uh, it Oh, yeah, so that line becomes slightly, you know, stronger. This <laughs> yeah, one, yeah. Stronger. True, yeah, yeah, so true. quite stronger by in, including the recent duty ring abundance. So D, D, D over H becomes, you know, dominated. You know, yeah, I know. I know. So. It was too, too <laughs> much work, sorry, to change the figure. <laughs> No, I was no, on holidays no. this past week, but uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you very I know. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank my, you. My yeah. And the second point is that, the, yeah, uh, the Sasha Dorogov also pointed out that the, before the infection point inflation appeared, even many people have read, had written for PBH formations. And so uh, some of them don't, uh, don't uh, make use of ultra slow loans because we need fine tuning or we need waterfall mechanism at the end of inflation. So it might yes. be not a single field, completely single field. So I agree with you. If you stick to single field, completely single field, then yeah, infection point plus something would be the best, best model, I think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> very good. Are there any more comments or questions? <clears throat> so if not, let's maybe conclude the official part and, and thank Guillermo again. Thank you. And um, now we have uh, the coffee break. Um, so we will open some breakout rooms if someone wants to have a private discussion with someone. And otherwise, uh, we will stay in, in the main room here and, and can chat a bit uh, during the coffee break. Um, <clears throat> and maybe we stop the recording.